Welcome to the Quiet of the Night podcast. Currently a Repairman Jack book review and discussion podcast. I am your host, Gillian. And this episode is about the second book in the Repairman Jack series, Legacies. I'm going to start with a quick review and then move on to discussing plot points in detail. For my quick review, I want to say that I like Legacies more than The Tomb. Uh, Legacies is a much more straightforward Repairman Jack novel. Uh, the Tomb, I think, is is good in its own way, but because it is the first book, it has all those flashbacks to into into Jack's past and also into the uh, uh, West Phelan past. Um, so it kind of is a little bit scattered in in some ways. Uh, Legacies is a you know straightforward A to B to C plot line mostly. Yeah, so not saying that I don't like the more complex plot lines. Overall, the story is has a better pace. The action is a little tighter and more refined. The lack of supernatural horror elements kind of makes Legacies an outlier to the rest of the Repairman Jack series. I mean, the reason for this is that this novel was not meant to like continue uh, the supernatural elements. Uh, the story that I've heard is that Wilson was under contract to write three medical thrillers for a publisher. And if, for some reason, the third one just wasn't come along very well. But he had an idea for a Repairman Jack novel. And so in order to fit it into the medical thriller genre... He made the main character, Alicia uh, Clayton, Alicia Clayton, into a medical doctor, uh, thus putting Repairman Jack into a medical thriller, even though the actual plot of the story doesn't, doesn't revolve around any sort of medical practice. <laughs> but I do feel like her profession as a as a doctor is well integrated in the story. You know, all the scenes of her as a, you know, working as a doctor are well done, which I think because F. Paul Wilson is a doctor, you know, is probably where that comes from. The final thing I want to say in my review is that I grossly misrepresented the, the amount of child abuse that was in this book. While it isn't, as it isn't explicitly described, it is mentioned and is much more and is more of a plot point than I remembered. I think it's well done. Uh, there's a lot of respect given toward the victims, and a lot of sympathy is given toward Alicia by from Jack. And, yeah, so it was just more than I had remembered. It was, the abuse was mentioned and was more central central to the plot than I remembered. Um, so that is something to keep in mind if, I don't, I don't know for whatever reason you're listening to this before reading the book. Okay, on to the discussion, which I will start with the fixes like I did last time. So the first fix is probably my favorite fix in this novel and in the last novel, um, which is finding the stolen Christmas toys for the uh, HIV positive kids. It's a very uh, festive fix, considering that the novel is set at Christmas time. Yeah. And... It's not a very complicated fix. You know, Jack... Jack's preparation for the fix is basically just... Wearing a bulletproof vest. And in order to find the guy, he simply puts out some feelers... And pretends to be a buyer. You know, it's very simple. You know, the, co the complicated part of the whole thing is just... 
the complicated part, well, if, you know, even beating up on the guy is not very complicated. You know, it's just the, the showmanship of pretending to be Santa Claus while beating this, this guy up and then tying him to the bumper of his own truck and driving him through traffic. It's just, I don't know, there's something very satisfying to me about that. You know, there's just this element of karma that is just chef's kiss. I like that he does it basically at the behest of Gia. Gia, who has, who in the previous novel was completely against his, his profession, uh, to the point of breaking up with him and like refusing to see him at all until, you know, she absolutely had to. Um, and in this, in this novel, that they are now in a on again, off again relationship. It's it's sad, but I think it's more on again than off. You know, she's reconciled to herself that while well, Jack's profession is illegal and dangerous and violent, that he is the only reason that her daughter is still alive. If Jack had had any other profession, if he had been an accountant or if he had been even, even if he had just been a cop, you know, he wouldn't have had the skills or connections to save Vicky. So, you know, she's kind of reconciled herself with, you know, his profession she hates it, but she can live with it now, you know. And, you know, I like the fact that, you know, I, I like that she, you know, when, um, you know, he, you know, he puts it to her, you know, about what if I was retired? And she comes back and says, I would have asked you to put on your repairman jack suit and go out and find those toys. And, you know, he kind of like does a double take it then she's like I know I'm a hypocrite I don't care so you know it's in, it's nice to see I like that they are in a relationship this is you know like the norm for the rest of the novels I'm gonna I'm just gonna kind of spoil that a little bit is that they are a couple for the rest of the uh, 14 books all the way up to, you know, Night World, you know, which I, I don't know if, because in, in Night World, they are together. And, you know, he started writing these books years later after Night World. So I presume that he decided, well, it would be too complicated for them to break up and then get back together in a book, you know, for no reason other than, you know, add drama. So I guess he, I guess Wilson just decided that, you know, they're in it together for the long haul now. Uh, okay. Uh, next fix. The second fix, well, the second job that Jack is offered in the book is from Elisa Clayton to burn down her father's house that she inherited. Uh, surprisingly, Jack doesn't you know, immediately reject this job. Normally when it comes to activities that are, um, that are straight up illegal, such as burning down a house or killing someone, um, he usually just refuses. Which probably doesn't make sense, given that Jack has admitted to being a criminal, but refuses to do criminal activities. And I think this also plays into the fact that Jack is primarily a con man. He likes to operate in a... He likes to put one over on his, vic, on his victims. Get the upper hand in a clever manner. Simply burning down a place is not clever. If he could trick someone into burning down their own house, he probably would. 
You know, it's odd that he doesn't deny, he doesn't reject the job out of hand. But I think he was interested in the situation. You know, Alicia didn't want the house, but she didn't want Thomas to have the house. You know, she would rather it just simply burn to the ground than to give it up to anyone. The next fix that I want to talk about is not really a fix that he did for anyone in particular. More of a spur of the moment bit of theatrics. And that is uh, after, you know, his meeting with Alicia, she sees him uh, take on a group of three carjackers trying to jack... Uh, Julio's car and he is able to intimidate them by pretending to pluck to pluck the eye from one guy out and eat it to intimidate the other two um, using a little bit of like pepper spray to uh, you know make the guy go make the one guy go down it's kind of funny that in this scene Jack says that you know, taking on three guys is, you know, Hollywood stuff. But later on, when Alicia is kidnapped, he takes on, I think it's three guys. Uh, or is it just the two? The driver and Sam Baker, probably. Yeah, just the two. But still, you know, in that case, again, he's overwhelmed. And is able to fake his way through that encounter with a little bit of theatrics by pretending to be weaker than he is. And striking, you know, with surprise. Uh, much in the same way as he does in the earlier encounter. So, wait, maybe not so strange. Okay, yeah, so I just realized he didn't suddenly become an action movie hero in the uh, Alicia rescue scene. He just used uh, more of his uh, con man skills <laughs> to um, get the upper hand. The third fix in the novel is the most straightforward, like normal fix that he does, and it is the uh, is the con job on Ramirez to get money back for Jorge. Very simple, he... You know, very simply, he pretends to be a real estate agent and... cons Ramirez into giving him a... cast... a cash deposit... you know, for... a place that, uh, is going for... well under, like, market value or something. Um, you know, he uses the incentive of being able to screw over, you know, a sick, you know, a sick man, you know, who is desperate. It's, you know, it's your basic con, it's your, it's your basic con job with no violence or, uh, yeah, with no violence. This is an interesting one because we actually get like hard numbers on like, uh, on what he makes in, from this job. So he gets 12000 from Ramirez, and then uh, Sung, who is like Ramirez's rival, gives him 15000 for a total of uh, 27000 total. So then Jorge gets 6000 which is what he was owed. Uh, he gives Alicia 15000 for the center for the kids with HIV. 500 goes to Dolores, who is the real estate, um, the realtor who he uh, kind of like spoofs and like kind of fake rents the house from. Uh, and then he keeps $5,500. It, it's a clean, simple fix. Um, not much more to say about it. And the final fix is. It's more of an investigation into Ronald Clayton and the people who want to, you know, buy the house. After Alicia is kidnapped, he kind of like, after Alicia is kidnapped, 
he kind of uh, falls into the investigation, although he is extremely curious as to what is going on and kind of has to uh, tamp down that his curiosity so that it seems like it's Alicia's idea to let him in. You know, uh, so yeah, I mean, that detail in this last fix would basically f would be detailed in the last like half of the book. So I won't go into too much detail. I really did like the uh, build and hacking sequence. It's not something that is seen very often or portrayed in such a way. It was different than simply portraying, you know, Jack uh, breaking into, you know, the, the offices somehow. And Milk Doug, I, I, I really do like the character of Milk Doug. Milk Doug. He just is kind of a, he, seems, he just seems like a fun guy. <laughs> you know, his love of movies and his kind of uh, exploratory personality. I tried looking around to see if build and hacking is something that's still done. Unfortunately, searching for just build and hacking brings up a lot of result, results for hacking into like smart buildings, computer hacking into smart buildings. And kind of ex expanding the search brings up uh, urban explorers who go into abandoned buildings. Um, you know, which is not quite the same as build and hacking as presented in uh, this in in the in this book, um, so I'm not sure if it's still around uh, under some other name or if it's com gone completely underground. I think the most striking thing about this novel compared to the previous novel is that it isn't Jack's story. Um, the story very f starts with Alicia Clayton and follows her for quite a while before Jack is introduced. And he doesn't become fully embroiled into her story until about a third of the way into the novel. And even then, he is only tangentially associated with her. It isn't until maybe like halfway through the, to the book that he actually fully fully joins her in trying to figure out what is going on. You know, and we get a lot of, you know, her interior struggle with the abuse that she went through. Uh, Jack doesn't really change much through this through the book. Alicia does, you know, Alicia struggles with, you know, her with her past. The police officer Will is Will is the obvious romantic partner for Alicia, you know, which she pretty much tries to avoid through most of the, through most of it. I expected to like him less than I did. I remembered him, you know, kind of forcing her into, you know, dates and, you know, uncomfortable situations. Uh, more than actually happens, he does kind of, you know, insist on going on a date with her. You know, going on a couple days with her, but their last date appears to be completely voluntary on her part, um, and it almost ends. It ends with her having a violent reaction from his um, close proximity, which he you know takes pretty well in stride, and you know leaves you know when she insists. I do wish that there had been maybe a slight focus on Alicia perhaps going into therapy after this whole uh, plot had, had wrapped up. The end of the novel implies that she's going back to Will and maybe she's going to tell him about you know her past and maybe they will work on it together. I don't know. Um... It's a little ambiguous. I wish that it had been a little less ambiguous about what she was doing next. You know. Oh, uh, since this novel is doesn't have any supernatural horror elements, it doesn't link back to the rest of the secret history of the world um, really at all. The only link that I've caught was Kaze Group, 
which I think is a reference to The Black Wind, a novel that is loosely associated with the secret history of the world, sort of on the fringes. One more thing I want to bring up is something that I found a little uncomfortable, which was was the way Wilson characterized Kamel Muhalala, one of the Saudi Arabian men, uh, one of the men from the Saudi Arabian oil company or lobby group. I'm not sure exactly what they were. But anyway, the way he characterized him as uh, a sort of lustful man felt somewhat uncomfortably close to the way Kasum from the previous novel had sort of... It felt uncomfortably close to the way Kasum from the previous novel kind of had a issue with Western attire, seeing it, seeing it as provocative and you know overly sexual. I don't know. It just seems it seems like a kind of type to have you know these these foreign men lusting after American women. Yeah, you know, and I I think it only appears in one section. And maybe it's just to give him a little more character, but it does feel like it just falls into a type, a stereotype. Just yeah, just wanted to mention that um, as something that I noticed. The Repairman Jack Film Festival in this novel is centered around Dwight Fry, who plays supporting roles in the three movies mentioned, which are The Maltese Falcon from 1931, Dracula also from 1931. And the Vampire Bat from 1933. The Maltese Falcon is centered around uh, Sam Spade, a private detective who gets involved in who gets involved with a group of people who are all trying to acquire the titular Maltese Falcon, a very valuable statue. The individuals and groups are all willing to double cross and kill each other to get this to get the the falcon. This is a fairly direct call out to how the groups in the novel are willing to go to extreme measures to acquire the MacGuffin of the novel, and it kind of mirrors uh, Jack's involvement in the novel as he is pulled into the intrigue by a woman, much as Sam Spade is pulled into the mess of the Maltese Falcon in the movie. Dracula doesn't have, as far as I can tell, any real call-outs to the, the novel. Uh, there is a small bit of fluff about Renfield leasing a property for Dracula to inhabit, which might be a minor call out to the Carlton, the Carlton house in the novel. The Vampire Bat is an outlier. The Vampire Bat is interesting in that it is not a movie about it is it is not a horror movie it does begin as a horror movie with characters dying from loss of blood and the local villagers believing a vampire is responsible toward the end of the movie it becomes apparent that the doctor who has been examining the corpses and treating patients throughout the movie is responsible for the is responsible for these deaths. Uh, he has been using telepathy to control his assistant to drain people of their blood and feeding it to some sort of creature that he has created. Uh, so it does take a sort of it does take a twist at the end into light sci-fi, which kind of mirrors how this book is not the same as the previous book. Whereas, you know, the previous book was supernatural horror. This book has a thriller bent with a slight sci-fi twist at the end. 
This episode was recorded on time. Uh, I had some difficulties getting into the proper headspace to edit the audio. So it is two weeks late. I am going to try to get back on schedule. I will have a special topic episode either on the 16th or the 23rd. Uh, but I will have the next book discussion episode on the 30th for Conspiracies. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to to that episode because, well, I'll talk about it when I get there. Um, so I'll be back either next week or the week after. And then in three weeks, definitely, for the third book, Conspiracies. This is a good place to end it. As always, you can send me questions or comments to Quiet of the Night Podcast at gmail.com. This has been the Quiet of the Night Podcast. I have been your host, Gillian. Have a good night. Mm-hmm.